Good afternoon. Um, great to be here, and now we have to really make a major shift. <laughs> we are moving from, from wartime Ashkenazi world to um, the, the Moroccan Sephardi experience. I, I chose this title, Encoded Messages in the Jewish Music of Morocco, because of the fact that many times we listen to music, we hear performances, and we think of it only in, in, in the aesthetics of the sound and the melody, and, but in this community and in that society, the, the music is really just a vehicle for a message that's being passed on. And so what, what I'll try to do this afternoon is to give explanations of different um, situations, contexts, and, and manners in which uh, these, these forms of encoding taboo subjects or subjects that are, um, that are sensitive or subjects about the survival of the group or secret, secret messages that, that you can say in a mixed audience but that only those that understand will get. And so these are all the different layers of what we'll be looking at. Let's see. So I, I always like to start with a, a general map of where exactly is Morocco. Some people call it the California of Africa, right? It's on, on the west coast. It has, a, um, and we have Spain, which is just 14 kilometers from, from the north of Morocco. So we, there's that very clear back and forth linguistic, cultural, musical um, of information. Um, the historic migrations that have been constant, and, um, and, and then also as well the importance of, of seeing this connection to Africa, to Mauritania, and to the Maghreb, Algeria, and the rest of the Maghreb. Thank you. So, um, so this is a, geographically, it's, it's important to situate where Morocco is because its geography has actually shaped the history of the country as a whole, but actually it also really has shaped the Jewish community because the Jewish community has, uh, has had waves of migra immigrations and emigrations, and, and because of that, the community itself is very layered. It's not a, a monolithic community. Um, Time-wise, linguistically, culturally, socially, so here what I'd like to do is to throw a little theory at you with a little French in there. I'm sorry, it's a, I've written it out in French. But what I'll do is I'll explain this to you. This is actually from the conclusions of my, of my dissertation. Um, my work has been actually on the songs of Judeo-Spanish women and of the Jewish community of northern Morocco. What I found is actually that there are, um, there are different layers of repertoire. And through these layers of repertoire, there are moments of, uh, of feeling a certain belonging to the core group, and then of connecting to all the layers of the cultures of contact. So if you look at the top graph, we have um, the, the heart of the repertoire right at the center. And those are the songs that everybody thinks of as uh, typically Ladino songs, the romances and the uh, songs for the life cycle. Um, those are the songs that they call our songs, our material. So when, when you say that, when you sing that, it's immediately uh, a call of identity. The next layer out are paraliturgical or satirical songs, which tell the local history of the community. Um, and, and the third one out are the general Jewish world. So they're liturgical Jewish material. So it can connect with Jews all over the world. Outside of that, then we have songs of the culture of contact. So Spanish, the Spanish and the Moroccan communities. So it would be maybe flamenco music or uh, a villancico of Christmas that people just happen to know or children's songs. But something that's very interesting 
is that Jewish women would take these songs and incorporate them into a very private moment of putting their children to sleep. So at a moment of great intimacy, then they would take the music and the songs and the narratives of the cultures of contact and drive it into the heart of their intimate unit, which I believe is a way to familiarize the younger generation with the culture that they lived in, not just a Jewish culture, but their, their culture of contact. So that what I call it is this, this oscillation between we have our repertoire, we have our songs, we have our narratives, we have our stories, and then we also know the stories of the other, we bring them in to our moments of intimacy, and then we go back out, we know them, but they're not really ours. But what, what happens is that eventually, maybe 200, 300 years later, those songs that were on the outer skirts of the circle become part of the inner circle because they've been passed down. And they become the material of that inner belonging. So th there's this, this interesting um, movement of what is ours, what has been other, what then becomes part of our essence, even though if you listen to the text, it has nothing really to do with, supposedly, with anything Jewish. A song about a princess in a throne that's uh, singing at the ocean to, the, to throwing her sins into the sea. But in the Jewish community of Tangier, that is a Jewish song. 500 years ago in Spain, it was just a, a romance. And, and so this is what I want to talk about today. It's this, this connection of how do we define what is Jewish through words? How do we define how we build our Jewish identity in this space of cultures of contact, in this uh, relationship we, of, of diaspora, of being surrounded, of having multiple as we say in French, les, les multiples appartenances. We belong to many, many different places, many different people. We, we are multiple as Jews and as Sephardi Jews, even more so because Sephardi Jews have multiple spectrum of languages constantly and of literatures and of texts and of songs. So how does this negotiation define what it is to be a Jew? what it is to be a Sephardi Jew, what it means to be a Moroccan Jew, what it means to be a Moroccan Sephardi Jew from Tangier, for example. And it's, it's these layers um, and this movement and this negotiation between these layers through music, through songs, and through the texts of these songs that I want to talk about today. So, so as uh, just the, the base, we should know there are various Jewish communities in Morocco. The most ancient one is uh, the Judeo Amazigh, the, the Berber community of Morocco, which uh, arrived, some people say, at the destruction of the second, of the first temple. So uh, through the, the caravans uh, through the Sahara. So there was a, a community that established itself in the Atlas Mountains, and many of them they say, converted some of the Berber tribes to Judaism because it was before the, the arrival of Islam to Morocco. So they were animists at that point. And many of the, the Berber tribes seemed to appreciate this uh, new element of monotheism that they saw. They wanted to incorporate that. And, they, and then they became um, Jewish. Um, some of them continued to, to migrate through these, uh, these caravans of the Sahara, and, um, and they spoke the Judeo-Berber, Judeo-Amazigh. One of the things that's very typical in Morocco also is the, the cult to the saints, to Jewish saints, and this is a, a very Amazigh tradition also. It's, it has to do with the, this anti-Islamic, this pre-Islamic history of Morocco. Then we have the Judeo-Arab community of Morocco, which uh, 
arrived with the, the Arab invasion. Um, they say that there were actual um, Jewish warriors coming with, with the Arab invasion in the eighth century. And so uh, some of them stayed on the side of the Maghreb and some of them crossed into Spain. Um, and so most of these are actually became urban communities. So the Judeo-Arab communities were mostly in the urban centers. And then we have the Judeo-Spanish community of Morocco, which started arriving in 1391 with the, those, the destructions, the pogroms that started in 1391. And, um, and they are focused mostly in the northern part of Morocco. So something interesting is that the, the first Jews that arrived to, with, after the expulsion were going towards Fez, which is where that the large where Maimonides was and where the large Jewish community was was established since the 10th century. But um, men in 1530, so just 40 years after the expulsion, a group of Jews decided to leave Fez and to go to Tetuan and to establish itself as a comunidad de Megorashim de Castilla the expulsed ones from Spain. And they wanted to retain their language, to retain the Judeo-Spanish language and to not have to negotiate this uh, war, basically, which was happening between the Judeo-Arab community of Fez and the Judeo-Spanish community that had arrived from, from Spain. So we have this, um, these layers within the Jewish community itself, which continue until today. And these animosities, within the differences of, of the Jews still can be felt today in Morocco, in the Moroccan community. There are Berber Jews which will um, not marry Jews from the north and Judeo-Arabs which will not want to marry a Judeo-Berber, etc. So one of the, the things that I think is very important to, um, to look at is how oral tradition in Morocco is really the basis of, of knowledge and the basis of Jewish knowledge. So even though the Jews, we are the people of the book, right? But, but in Morocco, the, the book, there's a, there's a saying, I think it's a little bit further up. Yeah, this one. Yan Ben Gwalid from Tangier, one of the oldest families says, what's he gonna know? He only knows what's in the book. Ese que va a saber, él no sabe nada. No sabe sino lo que está en el libro. If you know only what's in the book, that means you don't have an oral tradition. You don't have a family tradition, and nobody gave you anything through a line of oral transmission. So if you only know what's in the book, that means that you can't catch the mistakes that are in the book. Because the book always has mistakes, right? So this, in, in Morocco, this is the basis of the belief system. You can never completely trust what's written. You can only trust what was told to you by your ancestors. So, so this is, uh, is, is a very different way of, we, we, we live in a, in a culture where the book is the book. But here, the book is important. And we also need to remember that what we were told is as if it's written, because it was told to me, and it's an unbreakable chain. So uh, some of the, the informations from these unbreakable chains that we cannot corroborate by any books are beliefs that are at the basis of what Moroccan Jews believe to be completely true. So one of them is that Ba'asa ou Shalomo, one of the sons of King Solomon actually came to Morocco and um, was taken in by a, a woman and raised by her and that he is actually buried in the south of Morocco and he's a saint and a Jewish family actually had tended to the, the grave of Ba'asau Shalomo until the 1970s um, when the community was no longer in that place. And now it's actually been taken to be a Muslim shrine and Jews are forbidden to go in. 
So it's interesting. So this lady whose, whose family had actually um, taken care of the grave said that she disguised herself as a Muslim once and went in and went into to the shrine of Basa U Shalomo. Um, another truth is that the, the Jews of Morocco have been there since the, the destruction of the first temple. And then throughout that, there have been waves after the second temple um, with the Phoenicians, with the Romans, of course, et cetera, all the way until now. Now we actually have some French Jews and some Israelis that are coming to live in Morocco. So those are, are very small migration patterns in mostly migrating out. Um, then there's the myth about Damiel Kahina, which may, maybe some of you have heard. She was a, a Berber princess who held off the invading Arab armies for 30 years. She was the head of one of the Amazigh tribes, and she, some people say that she was Jewish, that Kahina actually came from Kohen, that she was from a Kohen family. It's not corroborated, some people don't believe it, but so these are parts of the, the foundational myths, I would say, of, um, and of the oral transmission in, in Morocco. Another one is about Ein Sbilia. So what happened in 1391 when masses of Jews were leaving uh, Seville because of the, the uprisings against the Jews, a group of Kohanim went to eastern Morocco to, um, to Debdu, an area called Debdu. And what they say is that because of their, their piousness, just like Miriam, a well sprang up, and they call it the Well of Seville, because, of their, they, because they were Sadikim. And so this well will always continue to exist. It's still there. And even the Muslims call it, to, until today, Ain Sibilia, the Well of Seville. We have also another place that is called until today, Wedel Yehud, the river of the Jews. And that is uh, the place where the Jews are said to have arrived on the coast of Tangier at the moment of the expulsion. So if you want to go to the beach in Tangier, you say, where is Wedel Yehud, the beach of the Jews? There are only 40 Jews left in Tangier today, but it's still called Wedel Yehud. And, um, and one of the last things that, that is common knowledge uh, passed down is the fact that, that uh, a lot of the Sadiqim, a lot of these holy rabbis that people go to pilgrimages around the country, there are over 600, I believe, um, were actually shlichim. They were emissaries from the Holy Land during the 16th, 17th, 18th century collecting money for the communities of Hebron and Jerusalem. So many of them, we only have a name. Some of them, we don't even have a date of decease, but everybody says, oh yes, they were, they were coming from the Holy Land. So these are parts of, uh, it's important to know that this, this is the way that, that much information gets passed down in Morocco within the Jewish community. And so then when we hear it also in other kinds of texts, the, the, the power of the spoken text has a, a crucial staying informational power within the Jews of Morocco. So we already heard Yan. And, uh, and I wanted to, to look at this because of this, this whole relationship between the oral and the written. So we know it's, we, we're not going to think that a culture is either oral or literate. There is this oscillation between the two, right? Even in what we call quote unquote literate culture, the, the stories, the orality, we saw it in, in the, the issues of the Warsaw Ghetto, right? They're, they're talking about afterwards, we can't just look at what the SS soldiers said. We have to also look at the, the, the oral histories, the stories themselves of the people that lived through it. So, um, so even a society that we would say is quote unquote illiterate or that's only oral or that's primary orality, what is that? And a, relation, and a, and a community that is mostly text-based like Judaism is very text-based, but 
it is text-based, and as Frank Alvarez Pereira says, which I think is very interesting, it's text-based, but we're, we're commanded to read the text out loud. We're not commanded to, to only to read it. We have to hear the Torah. So there is an aspect of the orality of our relationship to the book that is important. So it's the, it's the, the spoken, the, the vibrational maybe, to say it in such a matter that, that it, it goes into the consciousness in a different way. In medieval Spain, a short song was a saying. So when you have a song, you're actually saying something. It's un decir, it's like a proverb, something that you say. And we have um, this issue of ritualized utterance. So in communities where we have also a control on what is said and where we don't have free speech in the same way and where societies are completely hierarch uh, hierarchized, hierarchy, yeah, is that the, the right word? Hierarchisi, and I have too many languages in my head now. Um, so when, when we have hierarchies that are very strict and boundaries that are, that are impermeable, people find ways of passing messages, of saying things without saying them, of implying, of having code words, of having rituals of speech or of song that become actually not the word of an individual, but the, but the word of the community, the saying, the knowledge of the community is passed down. So this, um, Eric Havelock is a very interesting scholar. He talks about Greek, um, Greek epic poetry, but it, it really applies to the way that these communities use proverbs and use songs because everybody knows the proverbs, everybody knows the songs, they're repeated over and over in different contexts at different moments and sometimes people, and women mostly, would not speak in their own words, they would actually answer with a proverb or they would answer with a song and in that song, you would know what it is that you had to learn from what the person was gonna tell you. But, but you could never say, and I've had an informant say this to me, with a song, nobody could ever say, so-and-so said that, because they never said it. They just sang it. So you heard it from their mouth. You know that they were trying to tell you something, but it wasn't them. It's this... Uh, codified word of the collective. It's a message coming from the ancestors that passes down. And so this is, this is what um, is very interesting to uncover. What is it that they're, that they're saying? It's an official communal voice. It's not a personal statement. So this community is not a community of individuals. It's not individualistic. It's tribal, still until today. It's family-oriented. Very important are the, the large family units. And the one individual actually represents the whole family, represents the whole group. So what one individual says is going to be the voice of the collective, which is a heavy responsibility. It's difficult, um, but, but it's interesting to to see it in this way, and to see then how do they use their oral traditions to then maybe say what they need to say as individuals using the voice of the collective. So, the first example I'm gonna give you is from Judeo Amazigh, from Judeo Berber. So today we only say Amazigh because it means the free people. Amazigh, and Berber actually comes from the word barbarian, so we like to not use that anymore. Um, so, Judeo Amazir. And so this song is actually a song um, from the research of a, a colleague from, from Berkeley. Her name is Sarah Levin. She recorded this song in Israel from a woman that was in her 90s that came from a village in the south of Morocco. And the translation 
done for her by Laksasi, Abdel Rahman Laksasi, is the following. I don't have a recording of it, unfortunately, for you. Table, what's the matter? I see you're feeling down. Is it because the server is on your left? Is it because the teapot is not English? Is it because the tea kettle is not a Russian tea urn? Is it because the teacups are not glass? Table, what's the matter? I see you're feeling down. Is it because the server is on your left? The table says to you, if one does not have money, keep him away from me because I am contrary. The table, if I have no money, this is not a song about a table. This is not a song about teacups. The table is a woman. The, the, the teapot is the man. And drinking a cup of tea is having sex. Going for a cup of tea is going to a prostitute. So this song here, she's actually saying, why, why are you upset? Because the server is on your left, because anything that you do from the left is actually done in a negative way, is done in a bad way. So she is feeling upset. And, and they're asking her, why are you upset? Is it because somebody did something from the left in the wrong manner? They served you in the wrong manner. The teapot, he's not to your liking. He's not English, he's not Russian, he's not, uh, the teacups are not glass. So here we have, we're not talking about tea, obviously. Um, everybody knows that it's not about tea. Songs about tea in Morocco are always about relationships between men and women, physical relationships between men and women. There's a group called Nasir Riwan, who's a very famous uh, pop group in Morocco from the 1970s, who actually wrote a song about the tea, also the teacups, and it, it has to do with this relationship between men and women. But as well, which I think is very interesting, that this is a, a song sung by a Jewish woman in her 90s, who said to her right before she left, women today give it away too easily. And then she started to sing this. <laughs> so, but the other thing is that in the Talmud, let me see exactly, that. I think it's uh, Nedarim 20b, let me just check that, yeah. Nedarim, uh, Babylonian Talmud Nedarim 20b, there is a reference to a table, to overturning the table. And overturning the table means having sex in a different sexual position than the usual missionary. So here, do they know this? Maybe, maybe not, but they obviously still within their oral tradition have the idea of the relationship of a sexual relationship to and, and the table. That has, that has permeated through centuries of orality into the Jewish women's repertoire of the Amazigh community. So that's uh, one of the encoded messages, the tea, the table, the cups, the teapot. The next one is about, is in Judeo-Spanish. So I, I put actually the two uh, women's repertoires, uh, or the three, I think I have three women's songs first and then we'll have the men's songs. Because it's interesting also to notice that the messages that women give and the messages that men give are very gendered in, in Morocco. So they're not going to be the same kinds of repertoires. Um, here, this uh, Judeo-Spanish song in Haketia, we'll hear Alegria Benjo singing it for us in the summer of 2010. <laughs> Veida, veida, se subió a la cama, 
delante al pepe, el niño no la nana, y vino el gatito y quebró el molino, me gasté el de vida, me jodito. ¿Cómo es al final? So why is she laughing? Negra esta es bellida, tú y tu mejorito. Cursed be you, bellida. You and your firstborn. Why? Because bellida married Pepe, the Spanish man. And before she used to do the Jewish cookies and the couscous, and today she's doing pig lard. Manteca de jaluf. So it's actually a song of resistance to intermarriage. It's a song where, and at the very end, This is the, the encoded message. The little cat came and broke the grinder. Y vino el gatito y rompió el molinito. This is it's the sexual act, again. Cursed are you, Bellida, you and your bejorito, you and your firstborn son. So the whole song is a song that is sung about a woman who wants to marry a, a Christian. She marries him. And because of that, she breaks the the communal imperative for women, which is to absolutely not marry outside of the community, absolutely. Um, and her child, who's a bejor, right, who's a firstborn, who should be given to the Kohens and who should be bought back from the Kohanim in the, in the bejor ceremony, is actually cursed. Um, but at the end, we have that, that message, right? Vino el gatito y rompió el molinito. You wouldn't even know that it's talking about the sexual act again. So here, women talk about this very openly in these encoded messages, in this manner of passing it. Everybody knows that that's exactly what they're talking about it. But the, and the woman that's saying this to me is a very, very shy and, and very pudorosa. Uh, uh, pudorosa. She's... Um, appropriate, very, she would never, ever, even with her daughter, she, will, she did not even talk to her daughter about having her period for the first time, for example. So, but here she's singing a song about a sexual act. So just interesting to see the, the way that people allow themselves to sing and to talk about certain things because of this veiled um, encoded language. Now I, I thought I had to... Um, put this, this up for you because I thought uh, this, this audience would really appreciate it. It's a qsida. It's called the Qsida of Hitler. And it's a Judeo-Arabic song that was actually written um, in 1944 in Casablanca by, uh, let's see, Ana Matityaou Ben Simhon. And, um, and the interesting thing here is that it's in Judeo-Arabic. So he's actually singing out the story of, um, of what's happening in the Second World War in, in Judeo-Arabic so that Muslims and Jews would understand it. And he's uh, denoting all the different uh, countries that take part and all the different um, political uh, heads of state and the different groups, and he always says, and all of us, all of us, all of us. So he's always coming back to the, the unity of, of the allies, the unity of the Jews, and, and he talks also about the date of November 11th, um, which is the signing of the armistice, First World War. So this is written after the Americans came to uh, Operation Torch to Morocco in 42, but before the end of the war. And I'll put some so that you can, you can hear. Um, yeah, here we go. Hasadika Askira, 
השירה, עלי לשמך על דברך, וכמוך בעדים על אולי. Okay, so this, we could just do a talk about that one piece, um, but that will be for another day. Here, um, I wanted to show you uh, uh, a woman, a Saharan Jew, uh, singing in Judeo-Arabic songs of fertility, and that are actually to be sung for a very specific context um, for the moment when the woman loses her water and she's giving birth. And the, the, you, what she talks about is um, the opening of the door. So that is obviously, it's not as, uh, as encoded as some of the other ones, but it's still um, somewhat encoded. Oh, you can't see it. Okay. Uh, yeah. So here I want to talk actually about the, the issue of matruz. And the matruz is, uh, is a repertoire that Moroccan Jews sing where they take Andalusian music, classical Andalusian Arabic songs, and have uh, stanzas in Arabic and stanzas in Hebrew. And it goes back and forth. And so in the last 10 years, actually, this group that's called Kinor David Maroc has, um, has been founded. It's with the last group of Paitanim, of liturgical singers that live in Casablanca. And, um, and they perform very often for, I would say, 95% Muslim audiences. And with uh, Muslim musicians, because there are no more Jewish musicians living in Morocco. So even though they love this material, they love, they are completely Moroccan, they want to be completely Moroccan, they're, they're Jewish. They feel completely Jewish. They feel very connected to Israel, to their religion. They're very religious, most of Moroccan Jews, very traditional. So there's this, this, these oscillations, as, as I was showing at the very beginning, these circles of belonging. So they, they belong to that core center, but at the same time, they go out to the edge. But then they have to bring it back to their core because that's who they are. And how to negotiate the two? Well, one of the ways is to sing in front of your audience a song that talks about this other core that's your truth, that's your core, and that you, you will never say to their face. They will never, ever talk about this openly. So, which is um, difficult, painful, but it's also the way that, that they're able to negotiate this, their own resistance and feel their own strength in a way. So um, I think that that's important to, to see that it's, it's actually a way of even though they're the minority, they, they can feel that they have their own integrity completely. So, um, so here I ha just have a listing of some of the, these contexts for encoded messages, Test, uh, texts that are destined for communication between women and women, so Jewish or not, so usually wedding and fertility songs, um, then across the gender divide within the Jewish community, like Beyida, the song about not having intermarriage, then between women and men, right, the song about the teapot, the encoded message that the woman gives to the man about her, her unhappiness and how he should think about how she's unhappy. She, will, she won't say it to him directly. Um, and then from the Jewish men to all Jews, the matruz, the song where they're actually performing in front of a mixed audience, but they're sending a very clear message to the Jews that are in the audience about that, uh, that belonging to that core shared group. And then at the very end, um, we have this encoded message of Jewish men to all Jewish and Muslim men and women, the Judeo-Arabic song, the, the Qsida, that everybody will understand. So um, thank you. and. Uh, more, more to come and any questions if possible. Thank you. So yeah, so it's, there's actually, um, uh, yeah, so he wants to know if there's any, um, any tradition to accept the Jewish woman 
the Jewish woman's daughter or child, even if she's married to a non-Jew. Um, so yes, the Jewish child is considered to be Jewish, um, but they, they will not always publicly um, be able to say that if the father is a Muslim, for example. So, so Morocco is a Muslim country that is uh, led by Muslim law, by Sharia, and the Jewish community is actually led by Jewish law. So the, the rabbinic judges are actually bureaucrats of the Moroccan Ministry of Justice, and they are paid by the Moroccan government, the rabbis, the, the rab rabbinic judges. So Jewish law there is law, which is not great for women, um, because laws of heritage, for example, inheritance. If, if, uh, if a Jewish woman is married, uh, then she does not inherit by Jewish law, right? That's the actual alakha. So the, some families go around it, but, but the issue is that if um, there's a Muslim father, then that child in Morocco cannot be considered to be Jewish because the, the rabbis will never accept to go up against the Muslim religious establishment. So there have been cases where some of those children want to make aliyah, they want to go to Israel, and the rabbi will actually write them a letter that says their mother is Jewish. They will never say this child is Jewish. They will say their mother is Jewish. So that then when they arrive to Israel to the Rabbanut, the Rabbanut knows, okay, their mother is Jewish, they're Jewish. Uh, but uh, if it's a, a child of a Christian, it's much easier because the, the Christians don't really have any legal hold in Morocco. Yes. It's, uh, it's an aging community, I would say, because um, most of the there, most of the younger people actually leave for their studies and many times they don't come back. And then after that, they, they take their parents at, eventually at some point, once there are grandchildren and all that. So, but there, still there are schools. There are actually four Jewish schools. There are um, five kosher restaurants. There are 30 synagogues, but there are really only five that really work, work with a minyan. Um, and uh, and it's, uh, it's a very traditional community, but it's not really a very orthodox community. There's a small orthodox group, um, but they're, most of the people are very observant within their family dynamic, and then, you know, in the afternoon, they pick up the phone or they go to the beach or they do other things on Shabbat. So it's, uh, and, and it's actually becoming more and more insular because it's becoming smaller. So before that, um, I would say maybe 50 years ago, the Jewish community was much more integrated at all different levels of society and in the artistic sphere, in the intellectual sphere, in the political sphere. And today we have people that are in business and in the political sphere somewhat a couple of um, people in civil society that are active, but I would say two or three really. It's not, uh, it's, it's become replié, uh, we say. It's a really, it looks more within than without, and people travel a lot um, because most of their family is outside of Morocco now, and so many of them actually have homes in different places as well. They'll have a base in Morocco. Many of the people that stayed is because of financial reasons. Um, or because they had an older family member that did not want to leave. So, um, so they, they'll have a, some second home somewhere else, and then they'll spend part of the year outside as well. So, but it's interesting because also, usually it's the women that want to leave, and the men want to stay, because it's a, it's a very friendly country for men. Well, it's interesting because... Um, with my Latin American background, is it easier to integrate into Moroccan life? For me, Morocco is like Colombia in Arabic, basically. It's, culturally, it's very similar, but because we have to remember that the people that went to South America were coming from that part of the world, the, the, the Spanish and, and the Maghrebis. They were leaving that part of the world to go to, to colonize. Um, so there are lots of parallels. Um, 
but it was also easier to integrate with the, the Jews from the north than with the Judeo-Arabic speaking Jews. The, the, the French speaking Judeo-Arabic Jews have more of, a, of an Arabic culture that is less Latin American. Israel was a very large migration at different periods, but it wasn't the only important migratory point, arrival point, because uh, basically the people that were less educated and that had less financial opportunities are the ones that went to Israel. The ones that had any other place to go to chose to go somewhere else. Um, they went to Paris, they went to Montreal, they went to, uh, the people from the north went to Venezuela, they went to Argentina, they went to Madrid, to Barcelona, uh, and, and, then, and then, of course, to Israel there was, uh, but, but after 67, one, one number that I think is very interesting is after 67, the, the joint number says that from 80,000 Jews, the community went down to 40,000 in a span of six years. So that was really kind of the, the ravine was 67. Okay, thank you.